Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for joining me for another Sunday Afternoons with Reverend Lucretia. I'm so glad you're here. And if this is your first time to this station, welcome. I'm so glad that you found us. I hope that you will find that you are inspired and uplifted by this information and that it is helpful to you. So the name of today's talk is What to Do If You Care Too Much. And the song is Take Care of Yourself by Maisie Peters. If you would like to listen to the song before you hear the talk, just go ahead and click on the link. It will be down below in the description. So God wants us to be loving and compassionate and caring, but what happens when we care too much? What happens when we absorb other people's energies and it has a negative effect on us? We're gonna be talking about the work of Dr. Judith Orloff, who specializes in empaths and highly sensitive people. We'll also be talking about Dr. Eileen Aaron, who talks about compassion fatigue. We'll be talking about how to take care of yourself, set clear boundaries and protect yourselves when you are feeling overwhelmed. It's a lot about self-care and self-love and knowing when you are too involved with the other people and when you need to back away. God wants us to be loving and compassionate, but we need to understand that it all starts with loving yourself. You can't possibly love anybody else if you don't love yourself first. We will be talking about the work of Thich Nhat Hanh in relation to compassion as well as scriptural references. So let's go ahead and get started with the work of Dr. Judith Arloff. She is a New York Times bestseller. She has over 10 books out there. She started her work in 1996. She has a private practice and she's on the faculty of UCLA. So her three books on empaths, she is an empath herself, as I said, and so she has some personal uh, stories about that in her first book called Second Sight. But her books on empaths are Empath Survival Guide, Life Strategies for Sensitive sensitive people, coping mechanisms for compassion, fatigue, and burnout, thriving as an empath, and Empaths Empowerment Journal. She has five other books, including that one, Second Sight, Guide to Intuitive Healing, Positive Energy, and Emotional Freedom. So there is another leader in this field on highly sensitive people, and her name is Dr. Eileen Aaron, uh, and so she did work in this area as well. But we're gonna be talking about Dr. Judith Orloff's work today. So highly sensitive people and empaths uh, share a lot of the same traits. Um, empaths are higher up on the scale in terms of intuition and absorbing other people's energy. We'll talk about the continuum. Empaths share with highly sensitive people a low threshold for stimulation and a large need for alone time, a sensitivity to light, sound, and smell, and aversion to large groups. Uh, the fact that it takes them a long time to calm down and get centered after they've had a really busy day. About the fact that they love nature and they are healed by going out in nature, that they love quiet environments that they have a strong desire to help others and that they have a rich inner life. Empaths are higher on the spectrum because they not only feel other people's energy, they actually absorb other people's energy. They absorb the energy of the environment as well. They take it into their own bodies. They internalize feelings and pain of others. They sometimes have trouble distinguishing someone else's discomfort from their own. Um, both empaths and HSPs, highly sensitive people, are highly intuitive and and spiritual. They are able to have experiences that other people don't have. They are tightly connected with animals, with nature, and with their inner guides. So as I said, there is a continuum. Um, there are people that do not have compassion and loving and sensitive caring feelings for others, and they are called having empath, empath deficit disorders. And these are people like narcissists, sociopaths, and psychopaths. And then we move along the spectrum to people who are loving and kind and gentle, and then we move along even higher up the scale to people who are highly sensitive people, who are able to sense things that other people do, don't, they are highly intuitive. And then at the very top end of the continuum are empaths. So it's wonderful to be compassionate and loving and kind. The Dalai Lama said, empathy is the most precious of human qualities, but they experience a deep compassion for others and they get exhausted from feeling too much. Um, and so it's all about developing safeguards for their sensitivities and setting healthy boundaries. Um, just in terms of the psychobiology, empaths have a hyperactive mirror neurons 
system in their brain. So they have special cells that are responsible for compassion and those mirror neuron systems are highly, highly elevated. They learn to be caring without shouldering the suffering of others. That's the goal, to strike a balance between the energy that is going out and the energy that is coming in. People who are emotional sponges tend to absorb the emotions and energies of others and get exhausted and depressed and anxious. But empaths can be very empowered if they take care of themselves because of these special abilities that they have. So she describes it as it, they feel like they're holding everything with 50 fingers instead of fives. So you can imagine if you put something in the hand of somebody who has 50 fingers, they feel every single inch of it as opposed to just five. They don't have the same filters that other people have. They can feel other people's energy and the environment's energy inside their own body. Empaths communicate energetically. They feel the energy field of others and they respond to that. Um, they are in need of strategies for self-care. And one of the things she talks about the most in book is, is heart meditation that you can do. It's a three minute meditation where your heart energy is blissful and warm and nurturing and provides solace. Um, it's about setting clear boundaries with energy vampires. She talks about different kinds of energy vampires. Those are people that suck the, all of the energy out of you. Um, she talks about meditating quite a bit, that it's always about learning to meditate. Center your energies when you are on sensory overload. And she talks about visualizations that you can do to bring yourself back. It all starts with being aware of when you're absorbing someone else's energy. And you need to find out whether it is your energy that you are feeling or someone else's. And one of the way to do that is to walk away, to get 20 feet away from them. And you, if you still feel that intense energy, whether it's depression or anxiety or fear or overwhelm, whether you still feel that energy, then it's yours. If you don't, then it is theirs. You need to set a boundary. So chronic talkers are the people that are most draining to empaths. Uh, they don't pick up the cues that you're not interested. They keep drowning you with their words. She says it feels like a machine gun that's attacking you when they just keep coming at you with all of their words. You need to take the initiative to stop the conversation. I hate to interrupt you, but because they won't. These people won't stop the, inner, the conversation on their own. It's up to you to take care of yourself. Chronic talkers will always find the empaths because they are good listeners and they are compassionate. And she says they wear a sign on their head that says, I can help you. So if you're feeling overwhelmed when you're out in public, there are several tips and tricks you can give you. Um, find a bench. So if, for instance, you're at a mall where there's lots of different energy, there's lots of different stores, there's music being piped in, if you can find a bench and just sit down by yourself for three minutes. Again, she has this three-minute meditation in her books and on her websites. It takes just three minutes to get yourself centered. She says you also need to eat. So empaths are particularly sensitive to food and they feel uh, that eating is a way of centering themselves and getting themselves stabilized, but you need to eat protein and good foods, not be eating uh, sugars. Uh, organic food is better than processed food. You need to strengthen your core and eat foods that are gonna get you centered. Uh, empaths use food to ground themselves. So back in the 19th century, there were faith healers. Uh, they were intuitives, they were called psychics, and they were people that could help you. Um, and many of them were very, very overweight. There was a story of one faith healer was 300 pounds who actually had to be wheeled around because she couldn't walk, she was so big. And empaths tend to eat a lot of food, not only to ground themselves, because they, but they build this wall of fat around them to protect themselves um, from feeling other people's energy to calm themselves down and bring their energy back to center. So it's about taking charge of your own energy instead of having your energy dissipated and getting frustrated. One of the questions you ask yourself all the time is what can I do to help myself get centered? So there are 20 questions on her website and in her books about how to find out if you are an empath or not. And one of the questions is, do you use food to ground yourself? And so if you find yourself doing that, that may be a clue that you're an empath. And again, she says using the three minute meditation will bring you back to center. She says, my body tells me if something's up. I physically get nauseated uh, when I'm in the presence of somebody who's overwhelmed or somebody who's very stressed out or somebody who's 
uh, anxious. She says when she has to make a decision, uh, she gets a physical symptom if she feels like she's going in the wrong direction, if she's doing something just to please somebody else instead of taking care of herself. Um, you feel energy in your body. She says she can't emphasize enough how important it is to bring your energy back to center, and that is your form of empowerment. So highly uh, empathic people, highly sensitive people and empaths are very sensitive to smell. They can smell things that other people can't. So she tells the story of being in a hotel room on one of her book tours and she was very, very tired and it was late at night and she just wanted to lie down and go to sleep. But when she got into her room, she could smell this chemical smell. And so she called and said that she needed to change her rooms and the other people said, we can't feel it. She wants us to know that for people that are highly sensitive and that are empaths that you often will feel things that other people don't feel. You will smell things and other people will say to you, oh, I don't smell it. You're the only person. Be aware that your feelings are real and true. And just because nobody else feels them or smells them or senses them doesn't mean that they're not real for you. So you pay attention to what you're feeling. It doesn't matter what anybody else is feeling. She says, we need you now. You are the people that will save the world. If all the empaths are hiding out, then all of their light is hidden. Their gifts are many, intuition, compassion, and a love to be able to go deep with people. But it is important that you fiercely set boundaries with people, that you fiercely take care of your own time. Again, meditation is key. Rest is key, that you need to be able to get enough sleep. Taking baths is and showers is key. She says when you are in the presence of someone else and negative energy is coming at you, you literally can go under the water and wash off that energy. It is healing. Empaths tend to be very playful. They have a very big inner child. They are healed by nature. So she talks about earthing. So earthing is where you go out into nature. You take your shoes off and you literally connect to the earth. You can touch a tree to get that energy. Empaths are able to feel the energy of the nature and the trees all around them. She has a visualization that she talks about where you're grounding yourself by feeling the roots, feeling the roots in your body, going all the way down through your legs, out through your feet, into the earth, and establishing yourself as grounded by doing this earthing um, sensation of having your energy going down into the earth. Connect to all sentient beings. So uh, empaths have an ability to connect to anything that is alive, plants and nature and water and trees. They have a higher consciousness. They feel all of the connections. She says it's a full body awareness of life that empaths have. So you have a choice to keep your energy field open or to close it and be sure that it's not always open. Empaths need to be loving with themselves. So the solution. So I read a whole lot of different uh, people's take on what you can do to ground yourself as an empath or an HSP and get yourself centered. And the first thing is to look after your mental, emotional, and physical well-being. Um, able to put yourself in other people's shoes, but that takes its toll. Uh, you are an emotional sponge if you are an HSP or an empath, and you absorb the energy of other people, and you might mistake it for your own. And so it's really, really necessary that you learn how to take care of yourself. The first thing you need to do is recognize who's energy you're feeling. Distance yourself, check in with your feelings. Who have you been around? What was their mood? And how did you feel before you engaged with this person to find out whether it's their feelings or your feelings? Practice grounding. So when you are ungrounded, you may feel frantic, stressed, in chaos, easily distracted, powerless, spacey, unconnected to your body and your life. Spend lots of time outdoors. Breath work, she talks about that as the way to reconnect yourself and calm down. Move as much as you can. So dance and and yoga and exercise, meditate, and make sure you get enough sleep. That's very, very important. So limit your social media time. It will drain your energy if you don't control it. There will be an overload of information and stimuli. You need to turn off your electronics for a certain amount of time every single day. Be open and honest with yourself. Don't let the opinions of others who tell you you are too sensitive get to you. You have special gifts that they don't have. Make time to spend alone. So if you're out in public or if you're at work, if you need to go sit in your car for an hour or if you need to go for a walk, if you need to get quality alone time, taking break from other people's energy, you need to recharge your battery. And it's okay to tell your friends and your coworkers, I need an hour to myself right now. That's how you take care of yourself. So visualize a protective shield. So it can be either a clear shield that is all around you, like an egg that is protecting you, a bubble, or it can be a cloak. I, I personally use a purple velvet cloak that goes from with a cape that has a hood on it that goes from my head all the way down to my toes. She says if you're in an uh, 
situation where there's a lot of aggression, with it, where you're maybe at a confrontation, where you're at work and something very stressful is going on, to picture black jaguars walking back and forth in front of you, and that will keep the energy of other people, the negative energy, away from you. Um, spend more time taking care of yourself, being able to say no to people, uh, more time in activities that give you energy. So if there are things that you can do that make you feel energized, whether it's reading or writing or sewing or playing music, do those things, focus on them. And take a moment before you say yes. It's very important that you don't automatically give in to other people's demands. Don't be afraid to walk away. So move away if someone's negativity is spilling into your body. Those unwanted energies are impacting you. And, and do understand that. Make your home your safe place. So recharge and feel comfortable there. Declutter. A clean space uh, will equal a clear mind. Empaths and highly sensitive people are very, very aware of their environment. And if you have too much clutter around you, it's going to make you feel anxious. Decorate with soothing colors and natural light. Use lavender oils and candles that will help you calm down. Use calming music that will help you get centered as well. You remind yourself to be an observer. So when you have to go out into the world or if you're in a family interaction or at work and you feel like it's um, highly um, charged with a lot of energy, just understand that you can just observe it, that you don't have to be part of it, you can just observe it. So we talked a lot about boundaries. We're going to talk more about boundaries, in particular this article by Dr. Seaman Aaron, who is a researcher, a trainer, a psychologist, the founding member of the Center for Muslim Well-Being. She's a public speaker and a trainer, and she reminds us that we are all starting off in this world with boundaries. So we all start off with an embryo with the sack around us. We all start off with boundaries. And then when we are born into the world, our Boundaries are our parents' arms or our caregiver, whoever's taking care of us, we're in their arms and they're watching over us. And then we go down into the world and, and step around and we're aware that we're still under the protective shield of our parents or caregivers. When we get to be about two, two years old, we understand that we have the ability to say no and we start setting our own boundaries. And as you know, two-year-olds are very, very verbal. You have no trouble knowing what they want. They're very good at letting you know what they don't want to do. As a teenager, you're focused more on fitting in and belonging and impressing others, and you turn down the volume of your no. You fear being rejected and being left out. And then when you move into your adulthoods, we are intimidated, anxious, worried about the reactions of others if we say no. We don't want to disappoint them. We don't want to hurt other people's feelings. So we turn down the volume of our no, and sometimes we turn it down so much that we can't even hear it. She says, late in our 30s and 40s, we get our ability to say no back, but it often comes from a place of resentment because we feel like we've been doing things we haven't wanted to do or be put upon or taken advantage of, so we get our no back. So we need to talk about boundaries. So boundaries make us feel safe and secure and certain. They keep the good in and the bad out. They advise us what is and isn't acceptable behavior, and they limit our own um, behavior too. We set boundaries for ourselves. And we need to think about taking boundaries as a way to create a space for us to say, that is safe. Rather than running away from what we don't want, our boundaries can be about creating safeties for ourselves. Our boundaries are an essential agreement, uh, ingredient for self-love and self-care. They will help us to feel nurtured and have confidence that so that we will be able to speak our truth. So she talks about the fact that growing up, she got this disapproval from her grandma, and she got it so many times that she learned to just stop speaking her truth, um, and she started being whoever she needed to be to keep other people happy. She started attracting people into her life who were takers, who learned to give at the cost of herself, and she was saying yes when she didn't mean it, and saying no became a painful experience, and it was a breeding ground for resentment. She became stressed out and exhausted and she was feeling depleted and like she was running out of energy because she wasn't saying no anymore. She realized she needed to take care of herself and she was responsible for her own well-being or the body will start to send signals um, like a headache or a back out, get backache or losing sleep. And most of the time when we get those signals, we just keep on going and we ignore those signals and they escalate and come back even stronger. 
in a more intense way. We will have more fatigue. We will have a low immune system. She talks about getting the flu for four weeks where she was very, very sick because she wasn't paying attention to her body. And then she says, if we still don't pay attention, our body will create a life altering situation where we get diseases and illnesses, which will force us to stop and pay attention. She talked about the fact that she ended up in the hospital with pneumonia and she was in the hospital for over four weeks um, and she was very, very sick. She realized I and I alone are responsible for my well being. I needed to start saying no. I needed to love and respect and honor my body. So she needed to tune into what her body was trying to tell me, to stop pushing herself so hard, to cut back and to slow down. She needed to relax and ground herself and develop hobbies. Allow your mind to unwind. Engage with things you love on a daily basis. I love that. So she says, don't wait until you have a vacation or you know, every six months you give yourself a day of doing something fun. She says, engage in activities that you love every single day, even if it's just for like a half hour a day. Um, don't wait for that holiday. Pull back from um, giving to other people and you will create a space for receiving. She says that's very important. She says she found her voice eventually and everybody rebelled. She felt like they were angry at her because she had changed all the rules. They guilted her into trying to do what she wanted to do, but she held firm. She came from a place of understanding and compassion. Other people needed time to adjust to the new rules. So the people that are most affected will be the most angry and you just have to have patience and allow them time to adjust to the fact that you're setting a new set of rules. Self-love is about owning our yeses and our noes. It's about consistency, causes others to respect our boundaries. Boundaries are a skill that is necessary for life, health, well-being, happiness. With practice, it gets easier. Saying no to others is really saying yes to ourselves. It's not selfish, it's self-care. So I just love that. We're going to move on to scripture right now and talk about our bodies are temples of God. So we read about that over and over and again in scripture, how our bodies are God's temples. So that means we need to respect them and take care of them. In Mark 631, Jesus is talking about how we need to take care of ourselves. And he's very cognizant of the other people around him. He says, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. In 1 Kings 19.5, so this is the story of Elijah. It said, then he, Elijah, lay down under a bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and go eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread and jars of water. And so the God sent an angel to take care of him and reminded him to eat. Matthew 15, 32, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse. So he's talking about people needing to take care of themselves. He set an example for self-care himself. We talk about it all the time that he went away to pray. In Mark 1, 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that praying and meditating, we talked a lot about meditating, is the transforming of your mind. Galatians 5, 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So again, if you have to love yourself first. And that moves us right into Thich Nhat Hanh. So Thich Nhat Hanh talks about compassion a whole lot. He has books on compassion. He's had several talks on compassion. He talks about the fact that uh, we are created to love, but you have to love yourself first. Compassion literally means to feel with. It means to suffer with the other person. But if you're trying to help someone and you suffer like him or her, you cannot help him or her, he says. Suppose you are a physician every day. You have to listen to many patients telling you about their suffering. The doctor needs to understand the suffering of his patients, but does not have to suffer with his patients. If the do doctor suffers, he cannot help. Helpers should have a kind of love where they can understand the suffering of the other people in order to help them, but you do not have to be overwhelmed by suffering of the other people. If you are trying to help, you should listen with empathy. If you have enough joy, love, patience, and understanding in you, you will not be overwhelmed by the suffering for the other people. 
Arrange it so that every day you can hear joyful stories. Get in touch with the wonders of life that have the power to nourish and heal you. Compassion is a verb. It is not a feeling, something we possess. Compassion is something we should be doing, building compassion and empathy within ourselves. He says, love is extremely powerful energy. It has the capacity to transform ourself and others. All love starts with self-love. Only by loving oneself does one become capable of loving the other. Take care of your body. Be aware of your body is the beginning of self-love. When your mind comes home to the body, the mind and the body are established in the here and now. And that's what we're all looking for. Your ability to love another person depends on your ability to love yourself. So just real quickly, I took the empath test and I came out 16 out of 20. So I guess I'm pretty high up there. It was so helpful to learn all this stuff and to learn about the fact that helping others can be draining if we don't set really clear boundaries. Why taking on others' energy uh, sucks the wind out of us and why we have to be really careful about that. So empaths have a sixth sense. Sometimes they can have dreams that tell you um, about things that are going to happen in the future. They are very intuitive. They have premonitions. They are too sensitive, but don't let people tell you that you need to develop a thick skin. That's never the answer. Honoring the special gifts that we have, believing ourselves when other people tell us that what we are feeling is not real, and protecting ourselves from the energy vampires is what we need to do to be able to move forward and be great manifestations of God's love. Compassion and empathy and able to love more fully, able to relate to people in special ways as we feel more is what's important. It always comes back to loving your neighbor as yourself means first you must love yourself. And so it is. Remember at all times, the power is in you. It always has been, and it always will be. Please leave me in your comments what you relate to, whether you believe you are highly sensitive or you are an empath, and what tools you use to take care of yourself. I'm sending on your way with many blessings. Thank you so very much.